high. So the, the, the topic for the month of February, love, sex, and triple X. And for some of y'all who are visiting with us today, you're like, huh, didn't know I was going to that kind of church. Just thought I'd go to church this morning. So I will say this um, unapologetically. I will say this this morning that uh, the topic of our message today and in this little short three-week series is we're talking about not just relationships, but specifically about love and sex and triple X. And the truth of it is we're going to touch on every one of those in our time together this morning. But what you're going to find is that the Bible, uh, a collection of books, 66 books that's been put all together in one bound book, so to speak, um, it has a lot to say about very, very modern topics. And truthfully, very modern topics that each and every one of us struggle with and deal with. And so you're going to see in this book that, that was written by King Solomon a thousand years before Jesus that, that God already knew what you were going to be struggling with today. And so, as I was preparing this message, it kind of, you know, you get into a topic like this and you think, well, that can be such a, a topical uh, message, a, a topical thing that we're talking about, but, but where is the gospel in that? Where, where is this message of, uh, of God's hope and God's love and God's grace? And, and as we get into the message, you're going to see that this is a very, very focused, very pointed message. It's going in one direction, and, you, and it would be easy to say, well, where's Jesus in all of that? Here's what I want to say to you this morning as we begin. God knows what your struggle is. God knows what your issues are and your temptations and your shortcomings and your anxiety and guilt and grief and even in some cases, shame. Now, this is where I say to you, let me see your eyeballs. Because, because, because God doesn't want you to carry those things around with you. Your God loves you. He created you with such an amazing, marvelous plan for your life. And His plan is for you to prosper. And what I mean by that is He wants you to have joy in your life. And He wants you to, to make decisions that, that, that bless His name, that glorify Him, that helps other people. And as you do that, you, you lift those things to Him. And He always, always, always returns joy into your life. And so if you're sitting there this morning and you're thinking, man, my life is void of joy and I'm carrying around guilt and shame and anxiety. The gospel says that, that God already knew that. When he looked down into this place and this time in history, he knew the struggle that you would have. So he sent Jesus to go to a cross and to give his life, to make the payment so that we could accept him. And in accepting Him, it doesn't mean that, that immediately, magically, all of our temptations and all that stuff go away. But as we learn to walk with Jesus and follow Him and do life the way that He has shown us to do life, He makes things better. He makes things better. And so having said all of that, I want to reiterate what I said to you last week as we began this series of messages. You know, here we are, 2020, and relationships and, and gender and all of these things, um, what's, what's appropriate, what's right, what's available, all of that stuff gets all mixed up, it seems to me. But the Bible is very clear. And the, the Bible, I say that anytime somebody says to me the Bible is very clear about something, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, you're about to be wrong, so I better be careful with that. Because the Bible is not always very clear. The Bible can be quite ambiguous about things. But when you look at relationships throughout the Scriptures, what do we see? We see, we see relationships with one man and one woman who are committed to each other, loving each other inside, inside of a marriage relationship. You say, Jeff, that's not true. I see men who were married to multiple women throughout the Old Testament. How did that work out for you? How's it going to work out for you, right? Not well. And especially what we see in the New Testament is God's plan, God's design for a man and a woman in love with each other. And you say, Jeff, I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if I buy that. It's okay. I'm not telling you you have to. But what God will say to you this morning is, is you have the ability to choose what you believe is what's right, whatever, all that stuff. But God's saying to you, you don't have to go through all the gymnastics of trying to figure it out because I've already laid it out in the text of Scripture to say this is what I have for you. I love you. And so the way that God most often speaks to His people in this generation is through His Word. And through His Word, we see one man, one woman committed to each other in a marriage relationship for life. And God blesses that. And God brings joy. And so, that's where we're going this morning. 
Um, last week we opened up chapter 1 of Song of Songs, or you may have heard it referred to as Song of Solomon. Uh, Solomon wrote over a thousand songs, but this one is the one that's regarded as his best and his most beautiful. And so last week as we opened up, Solomon and his fiancée at the point uh, were having conversations and we would see where he would speak and she would speak and her friend would speak. And so that was chapter one. We, we kind of tiptoed into chapter two. We're going to skip past chapter three because this is just a three-week series. But in chapter three, there's a short little passage where they actually get married. They got married in that part. And so last week we saw the importance of attractability but how many of y'all know that's just an appetite to come on somebody it's like when the waitress comes out and she brings those mozzarella sticks and some chips and salsa and they're really good but i didn't come here for your chips and your salsa didn't come here for your mozzarella stick we going to the ribeye today i'm glad y'all came to church so, um, well, I mean, I don't know how to tell you all this other than to get to it. I told you a couple weeks ago before this series that it's going to have a little bit of a PG-13 feel. If the day is that day, so we're just going to be grown people dealing with grown people topics today. Um, and so, so as we get into it, God's plan, the covenant of marriage. I just want to hit this real quick before I move on. The covenant of marriage. Covenant is a word that we don't use an awful lot in our society today. But when God looks at marriage, he sees marriage as a covenant between two people. You say, what's a covenant? Well, a covenant and a contract. If you think about these two terms, a contract, if you go into an agreement with someone, we're going to start a business, um, the lawyers will tell you there's a good chance that at some point in a year or in a hundred years, this thing's going to dissolve, and you need to have a plan for how you're going to get out of it. The contract says this is how we get out of it when things go bad. A covenant is the opposite of that. And a covenant says two parties are entering into a relationship before God with the intention that there is going to be no getting out of it. And we're going to be in this covenant until death do us part. Now, stop right there. Jeff, you realize we live in 2020. Yes, I do. Jeff, you realize that in your congregation there are lots of people who have been in marriages that didn't work out. Yes, I do. And I'm saying to you today... Like I always say to you, God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. Sometimes things don't work out. You know, are, 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 we, are we saying well, it's okay to get divorced? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is, if you're a person who's sitting here and your heart is broken and you still have, have uh, residuals from a divorce, I'm not here to bang on you about that. I'm here to say, number one, God's plan is for two people to work it together. But when two people are not following Jesus, when both parties are not mutually submitted to each other and to Jesus, it's going to be really hard to stay in that thing for the long term. So if you are considering getting married, realize that it starts with God being at the beginning of it. If you're a person who, who divorce has, has been a part of your past, just hear what I'm saying, man. Whatever has happened, the past is the past. God is here for you today, and He wants to prepare you for what's coming ahead. Now, having said that, let's jump into this, this message. The message today is called The Real Deal. The Real Deal. And I want to just continue to reiterate to you that if we're going to talk about the real deal in marriage, love, sex, relationship, we got to start with one thought in mind. What is love? And I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again. Love is caring more about you than I care about me. Love is caring more about you than I care about myself. And we see this throughout, throughout the Bible. Jesus cared more about us so much so that he left the glory and splendor of heaven and came into this world to be born as a baby in a manger. And the baby became a boy. And the boy went to the, became a man and went to a cross and died for our sins. That's how much he cared for you. And he says, men, husbands, that's how much you are to care about. Love your wife. See, love is not this thing of, of, I want you to make me feel good about myself. Love is we mutually connected to each other, take care of each other, help each other, provide each other's needs. How do we do that? Through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working inside of us. So that's where we go. Um, it means that for you to experience your very best in a relationship, I hate to tell you all this, but it's going to require some sacrifice. Sorry to tell you, but that's what it's going to be. Um, 
So when you, when you prepare yourself for sacrifice, prepare yourself for God's blessing. And so here we go. Here's the first thing. The wedding is over. It's honeymoon night, y'all. Come on now. You can wake up. And you can't wake up for nothing else. We're not talking about uh, Paul and the road to Damascus. We're talking about Solomon's honeymoon. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. First thing. Uh, guys, ladies, I hope something that's said here today helps you. First thing is that my words to you set the stage. My words to you set the stage. Now, leading up to chapter 4, if you go back and look at all the words that's spoken in 1, 2, and 3, guys, this is going to be shocking to you, but Solomon's fiance who became his wife did 75% of the talking. I'll just leave that right there where it is. Um, she did 75% she did of the talking, but, but as we go into chapter 4, Today, it's all Solomon. It's all Solomon. And so as we begin reading in chapter 4 and verse 1, I want you to notice how this is honeymoon night, but before the fireworks get started, he's got some things that he wants to say to her, and he's going to begin describing herself to her from the top of her head. Look at this. Verse 1. He says, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Said it two times. Must have meant it. He says... Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Now remember, in, in this culture, this is a culture where the women would, would wear a veil. And on the, on the wedding night, he gets to pull the veil back and he finally gets to see her eyes. What he's seen through the veil, he gets to now see clearly. Here's his bride and it is taking his breath away as he pulls that veil back and he sees her, her eyes. Your, your eyes behind your veil are doves. He says your hair, guys, write this down. Valentine's Day is this week. You can say this to you. Your hair is like a flock of goats. You can practice this this week. <laughs> your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. What in the ever-loving world is that mean? <laughs> Mount Gilead, y'all don't know this, and I wouldn't either if I had heard another preacher talk about it, so here we go. Mount Gilead was known as a mountain that, that had these black ghosts that would run down it. And as they run down the mountain, it would kind of create this shimmering effect as they ran down the mountain. Y'all know what my man's saying, right? She got the veil off, had that hair up all in a bun. It's time for the head to show this commercial, baby. <laughs> Well, she gave him one of them numbers right there, and he's like, oh my good, I don't even know what to say. And then, as if that wasn't good enough, look at what he says next. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shore, means that the sheep just had the, 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 the wool cut off of them, coming up from the washing. This is good. Each has his twin, not one of them alone. What's he saying? He's saying, you got white teeth, and they're and they all there. Praise God. I didn't know what was behind that veil, but I am so happy. I am so happy. Me and y'all can thank me for this after Valentine's Day. Verse 3, he says, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Pomegranate, red, picture her face kind of kind of blushing. This man's saying all this stuff. She likes it. Her face is turning red. Says your temples, uh, we said that, verse 4, your your neck is like the Tower of David. Now, now this is, I really like what he says here. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. What he's saying there is, is your Elegant. Like last week we talked about how she said, I'm not like those prostitutes that hang around where, where you, you have the sheep and, the, and all of your men are hanging out. He said, no, you're not. When you walk into a room, there is an elegance about you. That's one of the things I love about my wife, man. When she walks into a room, people, people can't wait to get to her. Her, her name goes before her. There, there, is a, there is an admiration for her. And he's saying that about his bride. He's saying when you walk into a room, man, people are glad to see you. There is, there is dignity there. It's beautiful, man. He's taking his time. And he's, he's, he's saying all of these things that are, that are so good. But, y'all know this. The opposite of that is also true. And if we're not careful, man, in the course of just daily life, I see this happen a lot where, where men and women in good nature are, are kind of ribbing each other, making fun of each other. My words set the stage, but the opposite can also be true, can it? So as we talk about the real deal, let's talk about some lies and some truth. What's the lie? Well, how many of y'all remember being on the playground when you were a kid? You were like 
seven or eight years old and, and somebody says something to you and you hit them back with a well, sticks and stones, they break my bones, the words will never hurt me. Said it all gangster like you were Ice Cube or something like that. You, you ain't touching me, but what's going on right down in here? Oh man, they said something that, that cracked you right in your spirit, didn't they? It's not true, man. Those words hurt. And the things that, that, that you say to your spouse about your spouse, you may be kidding about them, but what if, what if she is very self-aware of that thing? It sticks with her. And that sticking with her creates an issue. What if the things you say about him are an issue? It sticks with him and it creates, it creates a problem. Um, what's the truth? Well, the truth is that the words that I say, they carry weight. Yep. They can be good. That can be bad. Um, ladies, for, for you, the words that you say to your fellow, if your fellow, and I told you this last week, your fellow in some ways is like, is like a, a sponge out in the desert. And when you say something to him that tells him what a good job he's done, man, he just soaks that thing up and instead of being dry and crinkled up, he comes to life. Your words carry weight. And that is so important. That is so important. Um, the words that we say are the key to intimacy. But so many times, man, um, instead of building our marriage, we get frustrated, we go the easy route. So what's the problem there? Well, it's the danger of pornography. Let's just talk about that just a second. The danger of pornography is it's counterfeit. It's counterfeit. We, we know this, right? A counterfeit $100 bill, it's cheap, and if you've got the materials, it's easy to make. It doesn't cost anything, but there's no real value to it. And the same thing with pornography is it's, it's cheap, and it doesn't cost you a lot of investment to get to it. It's, it's, it's easily accessible, but what does it leave you with? Well, it leaves you with shame and guilt, and it leaves you feeling empty. It might have brought pleasure for a moment, but it leaves you guilty. What's the real deal? What's the real deal? The beauty of God's plan is the real deal. And the beauty of God's plan is that, that He has a gift for your life, and that gift is your spouse. And for those of you who are, are looking to get married, man, God has a gift for you. If you've just recently got married, God has given you a gift. If you've been married a long time and you've forgotten some of these things, what God is saying to you today is it's time to, to clean off some of the residue. Let's go back and look at what it looked like with Solomon and his bride in those early days. If you've been married a long time and the spark is gone, God's saying you can get it back. There is a, there is a method to the madness, and that's what he's saying. So we get that. My word set the stage. What else can we learn? Lord, y'all going to make me preach this next part. Here we go. Um, my sensitivity to you says you are special. Write that down. My sensitivity to you says you are special. So remember now, he started at the top of her head. He's working his way down. Look at verse 5. Some of y'all going to want to highlight verse 5 and circle it. And here, mark the page, y'all. Verse 5, he says... <laughs> Did we talk about the teeth? We talked about the teeth. Okay, whatever, whatever. Here we go. The Bible says, He says, Your two breasts are like two fawns, like two fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Here's what I got to say to you right now. Um, I'm not a deer hunter. <laughs> well, not, not, not in certain ways. Come on, somebody. Right. No. <laughs> Here's what I know. If you're going to go out and hunt deer, uh, it seems to me that these are fairly elusive creatures. Like, 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 like the deer hunters that I know, they, they scout things out, and they take their time, and, 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 they, and they get there early, and, and they're very quiet, and they're very, very, very subdued. I have never seen somebody coming on a horse with a lasso trying to catch a deer. What am I saying? Sensitivity matters. You don't go running up on those things saying, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Solomon says, hey, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this to you. <laughs> what the Bible says, man, is what it says. You know, y'all remember the pointer system, don't you? Y'all know the song Conway sang it too. I want a man with a oh. <laughs> I knew y'all know what I was talking about. Now listen, fellas, I'm not trying to tell you how to handle your business. 
I'm just trying to point you to the Bible right here. A man says they are like two twin phones. Just, just figure that out. That's the about that. <laughs> Let's talk about the real deal. Let's talk about the real deal. What's the lie here? Well, the lie here is that, that we've been together for a long time. Sensitivity doesn't matter anymore. That's a lie, man. How many of y'all know that couple that's been, you know, they're like 80-something years old right now. Still just as in love, things have changed, but, but he loves her and he's sensitive to her needs and she takes care of him. It may not even be a sexual thing. It's a, it's a sensitivity thing, man. Um, the truth is that sensitivity will always matter. It will always matter. Amen. Sensitivity will always matter. And sensitivity doesn't have to be this thing of, of, of cuddling and gentle and soft. What I'm saying to you is that there's a lot of questions within people who, oh, I started going to church. Does that mean if I go to church that my, come on, let's just talk, just us chickens here. If I become a follower of Jesus, does my bedroom have to become boring? Is it whatever? What's available? What can we do? What can we not do? Y'all are looking at me so crazy. <laughs> Sensitivity means that you're going to take care of your partner. You're going to take care of your spouse. And, and we're not gonna we're not gonna force anything on anybody. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be asking ourselves what what's, what does my partner need? What does my spouse need? How can I be sensitive to their needs? And that that comes up in a lot of different ways, man. But just remember this: God created sex, right? He created it, and He created it to be pleasurable between a man and a woman, and the covenant of marriage committed to each other. He made it to be phenomenal, and He made it to be fun, and so. Love is caring more about the other person. Now, I want you to just think about this next thing. I've got two questions for you. Here's the first one. Um, how do you handle a tractor tire? <laughs> right? You ever seen? Y'all ain't ever seen. I told you, my daddy was a tractor man. Y'all have never seen a man with a tractor and that thing jacked up and he's trying to get that wheel and he's pulling and tugging and throwing it down. Okay, you get that picture. Now, go to the next question. Next question. How do you handle an antique vase? Man, get your gloves on. You're going to handle that thing with caution. And you're going to handle it in a way that says, this thing has value. It has value. You're going to take care of that. You're going to make sure that you don't destroy that. Because, because not only is it beautiful and lovely, but it has value. And it, it adds value to your life. That's what we're saying, man. That's the sensitivity thing. And so, if we build on that, the next thing is that my attraction to you leads to passion. My attraction to you leads to passion. Y'all just are not going to believe what the Bible has to say about this. Verse 6. He says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee. What did he say? Until the day breaks. What did Lionel Richie say? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, anyway, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Yes, he is talking about what you think he's talking about. <laughs> until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Uh, that's what he said. Uh, now, now listen, I'm looking at it, y'all. Some of us, we ain't as young as we used to be, and so until the day breaks might not be available to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say to you uh, is that my attraction to you leads to passion. My attraction to you leads to passion. And so when we take this thing seriously of putting my spouse first, and I'm attracted to you, and I'm saying all of these things to you, I'm putting your needs, your, your cares, your wants in front of my own. And man, that's what leads to passion. Here's a couple of things. We talk about the real deal. Let's talk about the real deal. Well, finding passion requires exerting effort. Somebody said amen to that. <laughs> well, I mean, we know this, right? But, but it's one thing when you've been married about, about, about five minutes. It's another thing when you've been married for quite some time. And, and, and it's, it's Thursday on the calendar, and so Thursday is our day, so let's just go ahead and do what we got to do, right? No! Finding passion requires exerting effort. Now, here's the thing. If we're honest, every one of us in here that's married people, we have fallen short on this. We just have. We just have. And we want to know why our marriages are floundering and why the spark is gone. And could it be because sometimes, man, we just 
devolve to the least common denominator, the least amount of effort. So what happens when we do that? Well, the problem with that is the next thing. And we have a desire, we have the, um, uh, the temptation to start looking outside of our marriage. Write this down. The grass is not greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. When we start looking outside of our marriage, we're looking for something that's fresh and new and exciting. And God's saying, fresh and new and exciting is, and is available to you right here inside this covenant of marriage. If you would put the same amount of effort as you are into that, into this, yes. that grass will grow too. Right. That grass will grow too. So, the problem we have today, though, is it's so easy with our technology and our phones and tablets and computers and and all of the readily availability of pornography that is right there and it's so accessible. And, and the lie is that, that porn is just as good and it takes very little effort. The lie is that porn is just as good and it takes very little effort. Well, that's a half truth because it takes very little effort, but it's not the same thing. It's not even in the same conversation as two people who have found each other and God has brought you together and you see value in each other and you, you genuinely like each other and you care for each other and you're invested in that person. And the intimacy that comes from two people who genuinely value and love each other. I care more about you and I want you elevated. You care more about me and I see that and you want me elevated. And when we get together, it is this beautiful thing. Listen, if we're just going to be honest about it, man, this whole thing of stripping down nature and two becoming one is vulnerable and it's intimate and it's beautiful when it's done God's way. And he wants us to experience that. But the lie is that, that the porn is just as good and it's not. And the truth is, you will receive dividends on whatever you invest in your spouse. Man, your life gets better when you are building up your spouse. Last thing, maybe the most important of all. My adoration of you leads to your security. My adoration of you leads to your security. And security is such a big word. He says in verse 7, All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Last week, she told us, she said, don't look at me. My skin is dark. I've been out in the sun. It's probably dry and cracked because I've got to work outside. She said, don't look at me because, because, because. She listed out everything that could possibly be wrong. He's like, shh, hush your mouth, woman. Hush your mouth. Because there ain't not nary a thing wrong with you, girl. You fine. That's what he said. You fine. You are so beautiful. There is no one beautiful like you. And you talk about those pomegranate cheeks. Can you imagine how, how her eyes and her, her anticipation of what's he going to think of me? Like, like I've had this veil in my hair up and down. I'm exposed. And what's he going to think and how vulnerable she's been? And when he looks at her and he says, let me tell you something. There has never been another creature on God's green planet created that could come anywhere close to you. You see what how you see that happens in her face? His adoration of her creates security. He's not going to say anything hurtful. He's not going to point out something. I'm safe with him. I'm safe with him. Hmm. My adoration of you leads to your security. And then things begin to happen. Write this down. My spouse is my standard for you. My spouse. And that goes on both sides, men and women. Men, it's easy for us to look around. And the truth of it is, men, as you're walking through your day, there is no doubt that you're going to see lots of ladies that are beautiful ladies. It's okay. God made them beautiful. That is all right. But, but what you see with your eyes is a physical beauty. What your spouse has for you, the way she's invested in you and loved you and nurtured you and cared for you, that is a, a beauty that has depth to it. And your spouse is your standard for beauty. Whoever your wife is, man, it's, it's one thing for other people to be pretty. But man, no one measures up to my wife. Lady, same thing goes for us. We need to hear that, 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 that listen, I know me. 
And I know my shortcomings. I know the things that, that I have potential to do okay at. And I know the things that I'll never be good at. And if she always highlights the things that I'm not good at, how does that make me feel? But thank God I'm married to a wife who constantly speaks life into me, who constantly tells me that, that you're good and I love you and you're good to me and I value you. You know what that makes me do? It makes me want to do more for her. See how that works? See how that works? My spouse is my standard for beauty. Uh, providing a sense of security creates a garden for intimacy. Providing a sense of security. Guys, I don't know how else to tell you this, but, but especially for God, when your lady knows that she is safe with you, that it's okay, he's not going to harm me, he's not going to say anything, it creates this, this environment where intimacy can be had. Outside of that, you, you, can, you can go through all kinds of contortions and you can have all kinds of experiences. You can give your body to someone else. But until you feel like you are safe with that person, there are things that you're holding back. Yep. Guys, if you want to experience your wife in a way that you've never experienced her, create that atmosphere of security where she knows she's safe with you She'll open up to you in ways that you have never imagined. That's what the Bible says. What it tells you. What's the lie? Well, the lie is that I can have what I see in porn. No, you can't. No, you cannot. You, you, can, you can imagine it, but it's not real. It's, it's not real. And they, and look, I mean, I hate to tell you all this, but, but whatever y'all are seeing there, it's a whole team of people there with cameras and lights and, and all of this stuff. That's not, that's not two people in an intimate situation. That's a production team. And that's weird. And it's not good. And it's not what God... Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's weird, man. It's weird. What's the truth? Well, the truth is, I can have more than I ever dreamed with my spouse. I can have more than I ever dreamed with my spouse. Man, I thank God for my wife. My wife, God sent Jackie Lynch to me, and two have become one. And I'm going to tell you all what, man, on both sides of that equation, it takes work for two to remain one. Because the tendency, there is a world that's trying to pull two apart from one. But when two remain one, and you allow your heart to be, to be open to your spouse, and she allows her heart to be open to you, and even though you may go two different directions in your day, and you're going through your life, your heart's still remain in this place of oneness. And when that continues, it creates an atmosphere for intimacy. That's what God wants. Why am I preaching all of this stuff about sex and porn and all of this stuff? Because we need to hear this. We need to hear that God says, I've got a plan for your life and I love you. And I know you've got baggage and I know you've got regrets and I know you've got temptations. But I'm bigger than all of that. Is what God is saying to you. And so right now, as the music begins to play, I just want to ask every person in the room, just bow your hands, close your eyes. Everybody in here, just give your neighbor some space. Don't worry about putting your things away. Just close your eyes right now. Just take just one moment of silence and listen to the voice of God right now. As you listen to the voice of God speaking to your heart, I get it that we've got a room full of people that are in lots of different places single, married, divorced, all kinds of different situations. I get it that this morning, it's maybe a tough topic for you to hear. It's maybe <coughs> difficult for you to hear how good things can be because you're wrestling with how, how good things are not right now. But you know, the Scripture tells us that God is close to the brokenhearted. He loves you. He knows your situation. And I want to just take a moment right now. I want to just pray for you. I want to just pray for us as a congregation, the followers of Jesus, that, that we will be models, that we'll follow God's Word, and we'll have relationships that the rest of the world wants to have. Jesus, right now, I pray over every person who is hearing this message this morning, whether it's live in the room, whether it's through video later on in the week, God, for those marriages that are strong and thriving, thank you for that, God. Thank you for the fire, the passion, the love, the romance that you have put between them. God, for the, the relationships that are struggling. Maybe there's couples here today that are just trying to hold on. God, I pray for you. 
And I pray that your word, God, your word has power. And your word tells us that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And you tell us that when two people are working together, it takes two who are committed to you. God, as you're saying this to our hearts this morning right now, pray that if there's one here who's in a marriage, it's not trying, it's checked out, it's already moving on to the next thing. God, remind us of covenant. Remind us that you're with us and you'll help us. And for that person who's, who's moving on, God, I pray that you will sharpen their, their heart this morning. God, for that person who is so devastated, still in a marriage, but the spouse has done so much harm and trampled all over their heart. God, I pray that today will be a new day. I pray, Lord, that, that as you speak to our hearts, that, that I know that it takes two. The Holy Spirit of God, you can speak to both people in that marriage. And let them begin to invest in, in, in your word, in the way that you tell us to do this. God, I understand that in this conversation, there are people who, who sense hopelessness, who sense that things can never be, that that time is left, and that is just not true, Jesus. It is not true. Your word gives us hope for today. Lord, we pray for that. We ask you for that. Lord, this morning in our time, before we finish, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you will ignite something in hearts that has been long dormant. Bring it back to life. For those who are searching for love and relationship, who are single or are divorced, or, or maybe in that in-between stage, God, of separation, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, speak to those hearts. Give them what they need. It's a difficult, difficult place to be. But God, we're trusting you for that. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who has never said yes to you, God, we know that all of this is available to us through a relationship with you, Jesus. If there's anyone here today who has been running from you and has never accepted you as their Lord and as their Savior, as you're speaking to those hearts right now, Jesus, I ask you to help them with that conversation as they surrender their life to you. God, I say thank you for what you're going to do in this moment and in the days that are to come. Thank you, God, for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.